The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents a debate review of Is Christianity True? with Matt Delahunty and Trey Jadlow. Hey everybody, hope you're doing well. I did this debate last night, uh, and despite that, pieces of it have already faded from my mind. And that's a good thing, because if they stuck in there the way they used to, I, I would probably be uh, a bit unhinged at this point. This was another debate of modern day debates, and there are elements that I'm not going to bother spending a great deal of time on, but I want to walk you through what happened and my thoughts over it, uh, and maybe give some tips that might be useful, or at least I hope so. Uh, before the debate, I asked for clarification on what his definition of Christianity definition of Christianity was and what his definition of true was, because if we're going to defend, or if we're going to debate, is Christianity true, it would be nice if we had some sort of agreement. And his answer was that he's a Reformed Baptist, basically holds to all historic Protestant tenets, such as Jesus is God, he died and miraculously rose from the dead, uh, having died for our sins. And he uses a correspondence model of truth, which is truth is that which corresponds to reality. That is an interesting point that is going to come up again in a little bit, which I was kind of happy about because I thought, well, great, we agree on what truth is. And I should be able, having been a Southern Baptist, a Protestant for much of my life, I should be able to properly address his version of Christianity. And so based on those things, I wrote up my opening statement, uh, which I'll get to in a little while. But he goes first. And so in his opening statement, uh, let me start by talking about what it was, and then we'll get to what it should have been. Because... About three minutes and 20 seconds into the video is when he actually begins his opening statement. He starts a little before that, but that's just, thanks for being here. I'm happy to have these conversations. I'm grateful for so-and-so. I hope to have my, my views challenged, blah, blah, blah. And then around the three minute 20 mark, he begins. Um, he spends the first six minutes or so merely talking about what he's not going to talk about and why. He's not an evidentialist. So he's not going to be presenting evidence because the evidentialist models are probabilistic and probability just isn't strong enough for him. Uh, this is already a huge problem because everything we know and all of science is probabilistic. That's, that's all we have are probabilistic models. And there's nothing wrong with a probabilistic model because if you can get a probabilistic model to demonstrate a probability of 100%, then you have certainty. It's not the fault of the process that you can't get your case to certainty. But he's not, he's not an evidentialist, so he's not going to go down that route. He's also not a presuppositionalist, he says, uh, because they're essentially uh, defining a God into existence and making a circular argument. Um, my position is that that's exactly what he's doing, only not as a presuppositionalist. He then identifies that he's a classicist, and he's going to be presenting analytical arguments. Uh, and at around 9 minutes and 44 seconds, he decides that it's important to poison the well in his opening by saying he's going to give analytic arguments, and you may hear some complaining or whining or a desperate attempt to change the subject. I I'm not much in the mindset of, of falling into conspiracy theorist traps, but if in your opening statement you talk about how the, the other side might complain and whine and they might try to change the subject and you've been accused of trying to put words in people's mouths before, uh, that's kind of a, like a big light shining. Hey, everybody, watch out. Because he absolutely repeatedly accused me of trying to uh, change the subject and, and complaining and whining. Um, it's almost like he had this planned or that he walked into a debate with a mindset that was going to make sure something like that was more likely. He also stated that he'd been making this case for 10 years and there was no defeat of the argument and no valid rebuttal, and maybe I'm the savior of atheism. Um, he tells us that he's going to be giving us three arguments, uh, a contingency-style argument, a moral law and purpose argument, and then he's going to present evidences for Christianity from the general reliability of the Bible uh, and the science of archaeology. And when we do, by the way, get into his claims later on that he thinks are 
archaeologically confirmed, uh, I pointed out that they're not. There is someone in, in the Q&A uh, asked him, what evidence does he have beyond the claim that Jesus walked on water to support the notion that Jesus walked on water? And he went on a little side trip about how, oh, you know, the author of Luke Acts was reliable and there's some archaeological evidence and everything. There's no archaeological evidence, and he acknowledged this, for Jesus walking on water. He uses the archaeological evidence of the mundane claims, which we'll get to in my opening, to support a general reliability of the Bible. So he wants to point to evidence for the things that you can demonstrate. And then because he considers those reliable, he wants to let that reliability bleed over to suggest that walking on water is also a reasonable thing to believe, even though you don't have evidence for it. At 11 minutes and 10 seconds, he decides to give the first portion of his first argument for contingency. And at 11 minutes and 40 seconds, he's done. Now, I may be off a couple seconds here and there. These are rough estimates. but So his entire opening was, here's what I'm not going to say. I'm not an evidentialist. I'm not a presuppositionalist. Both of those are bad for these reasons. I'm a classicist. I'm going to give analytical arguments. Matt might whine about it when he might try and change the subject, but there's no valid rebuttal to this. And here's a little piece of my first argument. Thank you. I'm done. Let's get ready to rumble. Is I mean, literally, let's get right. That's what he did. Um, that's a complete waste of an opening argument. It's, it's just absolutely terrible. And I, I don't mind saying this. People are like, oh, my gosh, are you going to be me? No, no, no. I, he wouldn't stop during the debate and uh, suggested that, uh, I was just refer, you know, rep, um, calling him stupid, essentially. And so I finally gave in. And yes, you're, yes, Trey, you are stupid. Doesn't mean you're an idiot. It doesn't mean that you don't know things. It doesn't mean it don't mean you understand things. But he was behaving in a way that was incredibly stupid. And he did it from the outset. Because the way the opening is supposed to go, he acknowledged the burden of proof. Um, he just didn't even make any attempt to meet it. What should have happened in the opening is this. Hi. I'm Trey, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm here to defend the proposition that Christianity is true. Let me give you some quick uh, definitions of what I mean by Christianity and truth, and then you do that. And then you say, here are some specific facts and tenets that are unique to Christianity, and here's how I can demonstrate that those things are true. And then we can say, because I've demonstrated these facets of Christianity to be true, it is reasonable to conclude that Christianity is true. There may be some things that aren't entirely true. Uh, there may be some things within various versions of Christianity that aren't true. But the core of Christianity is true. Thank you. Now, I did that in a couple seconds because I didn't have to present any of the evidence or arguments for it. He could have done that. Nobody was stopping him at all, but he didn't. He wasted eight minutes of his 10-minute opening, which he didn't even use the entire 10 minutes, by not presenting anything at all that tied directly to Christianity or was expressly focused on the truth of Christianity. Nothing. And then he kept complaining and accusing me of trying to change the subject whenever I was the one uh, who tried to address Christianity and whether or not it's true. His hope, I believe was that he would start with a classical analytical a priori argument that would prove God, but that's not going to happen. Uh, there's a problem with him not being evident and an evidentialist, which we'll get to. Briefly, because we spent most of the whole first hour on this one point, the first part of his contingency argument was this. If something exists, there are four possible explanations. One, it's an illusion. Two, it's self-created. Three, it's self-existent. Four, it's created by something that is self-existent. Now, there was a lot of arguing and pushback on this, but right off the bat, I recognized that this argument is incredibly poorly formed. Because if something exists, then the explanation for its existence is, and then these four candidates... First of all, he, he asserts that these are the only possible candidates. He doesn't demonstrate that, but we'll get to that. But what he should have said to make this argument better, less confusing, and more 
amenable to us having a discussion about it is this. There must be some explanation for my experience of a reality. That should have been the first thing. Not if something exists, here's the reasons why. Because his version with if something exists, the subject being the something uh, could be me, could be reality, could be this pair of glasses. Uh, if this pair of glasses exists, either it's an illusion, it's self-created, it's self-existent, or it's created by something that is self-existent. It's formatted so poorly that it misrepresented what I believe uh, his argument should have been. And so let's start by changing the beginning to there must be some explanation for my experience of reality or if I experience reality, the possible explanations for that are one, it's an illusion because now the subject of the argument is his experience of reality, not reality. And an illusion is a viable candidate explanation for why you might experience something. Um, the problem is, is that illusion being an explanation for why you might experience something self-created isn't really an explanation for why you might experience something. But you could say, whatever I experience about reality is either real or not real. And if it's not real, we don't have to spend any time discussing it. So we're only going to look at if it's real. If it's real, what is the explanation for it? Is it or for its origin? Okay. So we've, we've eliminated the first one entirely. And so now it's either it's self-created, it's self-existent, or it's created by something that is self-existent. And the, the thing that I eventually pointed out, even though he wanted me to give a fifth option, which I did, is that this pair of glasses could have been created by something that is itself created by something that is itself non-contingent, essentially, or a, a contingent. And his purpose was to get to there must be something non-contingent. All of these things that we experience that are contingent, there must be something that's non-contingent. That's all he wanted to do, but he couldn't do it. And he didn't even construct an argument. I mean, you didn't even have to do that. You could have just said, okay, um, Matt, are you contingent? I don't know. I think that I'm contingent. It appears that I'm contingent. I will go ahead and accept for the sake of this discussion that I am contingent. Cool. What are you contingent on? Well, you know, oxygen, food, uh, gravity, all of, all of the factors of reality that go to make me here. But my existence, my beginning of my existence, is contingent upon my parents having sex. And you can trace that back. In. So the, the regress portion, the point is they want to get to, hey, is there something that's non-contingent? And I would agree that it's intuitive to reach the conclusion that there's something non-contingent. I just don't think that it's necessarily a being. And this is the point that he needed to actually demonstrate. So his argument was poorly worded and ill-structured because the first candidate is about his experience of reality. The next two are about the nature of reality or the ontology of reality. Um, it, you could say the first one, illusion, is about the ontology of reality, except that as I pointed out during the debate, if it's an illusion, then it's not real. And if it's not real, then it doesn't exist. And he agreed to all of that, which makes his argument, if something exists, one candidate explanation for it is that it does not exist. That's what his poorly worded argument breaks down to. And this is why I was having difficulty. I, we, we could have, I've already done multiple discussions on, on contingency. The, the, uh, the Muslim at debate con three, uh, presented a contingency argument, and I addressed that. I've done videos on it. And so to pretend that I'm trying to change the sub subject away from contingency is ridiculous. Uh, he just didn't know how to create an argument to say what he wanted to say, which is, hey, I think that there is something that is non-contingent, and I think that that is God. Cool. Now you have to do the work of explaining why you think that the, that the non-contingent thing, if it's required is also a thinking agent, actor, being, whatever word you want to use, because we got into it about being, and I had to explain the difference between how a rock has being but is not a being, and that the uh, in the Q&A when somebody asked, what, what is the ontology of something that is a being? 
or is an agent. And I had to point out that it possesses intent to act. Uh, that's how we define actor. Whether or not that's subject to free will or whatever else, that's 23 other debates probably. Okay, the other part was, this was pretty easy to, to rehabilitate his argument, which is, I have an experience of reality, why? Well, it's either illusion or it's real. If it's illusion, cool, we'll have to figure out what's creating the illusion, how does that work, and we'll have to see, this is essentially the problem of hard solipsism. If it's real, what is the explanation for, not from no longer from my experience of it, but for its existence, if reality is real? And you can begin listing candidate explanations, but for anything, when you list candidate explanations, they must either be logically exhaustive, for example, A and not A. That is logically exhaustive. Everything, everywhere is either A or not A. But everything isn't either A, B, C, or D. Because you have to show why EFG, Apple, Pineapple, Bicycle, 4, uh, and, and every other potential explanation doesn't qualify. This is, this is the reason why if you're going to do analytical arguments, classical arguments, you can't be sloppy. Um, a, a properly formed syllogism must have uh, a, the minor major premises and a connecting term. Okay. And if there's an inequality between there, you end up with what is essentially an equivocation fallacy. There's a reason why we use propositional logic. And it's because we can analyze all the syllogistic forms and determine which ones are valid and which ones aren't. And then the only issue becomes one of soundness. Are your premises sound? And soundness, by the way, is what this is all about. Now, he didn't demonstrate that his candidate list was exhaustive, and I exposed how it wasn't, and he tried to write it off as, that's just me adding in an artifact, um, which I don't think is accurate, but... It doesn't really matter if your argument is formulated in such a way that when I substitute a thing in for your word something and your four candidates do not accurately point to this, because if your argument is if something exists, it's either because of one, two, three, or four, and I say, okay, I exist, is, it, is that because of one, two, three, or four? And none of those uh, point directly to me then it's clear that you don't have an exhaustive list and your argument has been debunked and nobody needed to present another one of those. Meanwhile, if your first candidate is that it can't, you know, if it, it boils down to it doesn't exist, then your argument's also debunked. So for somebody who hasn't heard a debunking of his argument in 10 years, congrats, we did it all in the first 30 seconds and then he sat there and threw a fit about it. Um, analytic arguments are tautologies. In the same way that presuppositionalist arguments are essentially circular because they presuppose the very thing they're supposed to do, analytic arguments aren't necessarily circular, but they are tautology because the truth of an analytic argument is entirely contained in its meaning. Um, Kant potentially got some things wrong in his critique of pure reason about whether or not mathematical statements like 2 plus 2 equals 4 are analytical or synthetic. His argument was that they can't be analytical because um, his definition of an analytical argument was where the uh, predicate is contained within the subject. So saying um, triangles have three sides is an analytic statement because the, the definition of triangle includes that it has three sides, includes that in, in normative space, the internal angles add up to 180. Um, those things are defined within a triangle. And so it's a purely analytic statement. And if you have nothing but analytic statements that go together, that can construct a deductive argument where you have not the certainty that he hopes for, but maximal certainty because you're just, everything is derived directly from logic. And so I can see why there's an appeal on his part um, to the analytic arguments. But the problem is that they're tautologies, which means they are, not contingent on reality, but they're contingent upon your definitions. Um, and so a, a, it's not, I want to make sure we're clear, 
the fact that it's a tautology doesn't mean it's a circular argument. It just means that we we are going with what the definition of the thing is. And the problem with that is, much like a presuppositionalist, if your argument is purely analytical, you are then defining God into existence because you're taking something, calling it God. Where's the justification for that? Ah, this is why when we got down to, is there a non-contingent agent or entity, um, I would point out that I wasn't convinced. And I'm not convinced because even if I was convinced that there was something that must be non-contingent, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily a being, uh, that it's not something that doesn't have intention intentional action to it. Uh, for clarity, and you can go study the difference between analytic and synthetic arguments. This is uh, something largely con attributed to Immanuel Kant and his critique of pure reason. Analytical arguments are true by virtue of their meaning or their kind of self-contained synthetic arguments. Uh, the truth of those are synthetic propositions. I should be saying propositions for all of these. Uh, synthetic statements, propositions are true by virtue of their relation to reality. So triangles having three sides, the three sides portion is contained within triangles, and so that's just an analytic statement. If you were to say something like, triangles are the most efficient polygons for representing objects in 3D, I think, I, I probably shouldn't come up with stuff like that off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure that that would count as a synthetic uh, argument because there's nothing about efficient representations of 3D objects that is included in the definition of what a triangle is. Um, and yet, you may be able to demonstrate this uh, as a synthetic a priori and not as a synthetic a posteriori, which is a whole nother thing, a priori meaning before experience or without having experienced it and posteriori meaning coming from experience. So a synthetic a posteriori argument is the preferable one for me because it's empirical. It is not one that Trey likes because it's probabilistic. Um, Kant famously suggested that 2 plus 2 equals 4 is synthetic um, because it points to things in reality and the concept of 4 isn't, doesn't contain 2 or 2 or plus or anything else. And I think he's wrong and, and many philosophers have said that he's wrong there. Um, I think it's when you say two plus two equals four, to say that it's not contained in there, you're not looking at the entire statement. Uh, you're ignoring basically the plus and the equals. And contained in the definition of those are the mathematical operators that show that two plus two equals four is an analytic statement. So at least there's something that Trey and I uh, agree on. Truth, when we're talking about is Christianity true, truth is that which comports with reality for both of us, except not. Because if I'm going to care about truth, I need to have empirical evidence in order to understand what reality is because reality is not just a, well, does not appear to be just a concept that we define things in. Uh, analytical arguments can't get you to empirical truths. I could say you have a human father. Now, I could build an argument for that based on you being human and all humans having a mother and a father uh, because we don't have a demonstration of parthenogen parthenogenesis uh, and we cannot confirm empirically uh, a magical fathering. I, I picked this example specifically because Trey thinks that Jesus didn't have a human father and asserted that it was logically necessary that God impregnate a virgin. Now, I we didn't really, this was all during Q&A and so we didn't, really get to how critical this was uh, to Christianity because I was like trying to find out, hey, is this a key aspect? Why was it important that God impregnate a virgin? Um, and we even went down to the, okay, here's two women. One of them has had sex. One of them has not had sex. God, can he impregnate both of them magically? Trey says, yes. Cool. What is the difference in the offspring? Why is the one from the virgin uh, different and essential uh, to God's plan over the one that's from a non-virgin. And he said, well, why would God want to do that? Why would God want to do that? I, I, I don't know why. Uh, I don't know why you're asking me why God want to do that, because I don't believe there is a God or God did anything. You're the one, Trey, 
who believes that it's a logical necessity and believes that God did that. And so I'm trying to find out what in your model is the difference between a magical God baby from a virgin and a magical God baby from a non-virgin. But uh, he just wanted to move on. Nope. Uh, this is why we need synthetic a posteriori arguments and why evidentialism wins out. Because a probabilistic model is tied to reality. Yes, it is limited by our ability to confirm things. And as I've been on the record for saying for many years, I don't think we can be absolutely certain about anything. Um, even reason, as I believe it was Hobbes that pointed out to Descartes for the cogito, is that's contingent on the primacy of reason, which we can't demonstrate. That's the presupposition that we are all engaged in, is presupposing that reason is universally via, or, uh, reliable. All of the certainty that he likes in his classical analytic model is an illusion because it's contingent on reason and it's contingent on the definitions that he uses. It's certain within the very boundaries of reason, but it's not certain when it comes to reality, which is why we use scientific models we build scientific models, we build theories, we conduct experiments, we investigate, and we assign probabilistic values to the truths that we discover. Science isn't in the business of, pro of proclaiming that something is true. It makes models that demonstrate what is probably true and to incredibly high uh, confidence levels of probability. And, there aren't any higher that I'm aware of. The, the statement, all triangles have three sides, is not um, a non-probabilistic certainty. It is merely a tautology. It is merely a definition. And if you want to say that God is also tautologically true, that God is necessarily true, you have to make the case for that. And, and every time you do, you're going to be defining God as something that you can't investigate. We can investigate triangles. We can do math and geometry with them. We can investigate bachelors. We can, you know, uh, a bachelor is someone who isn't married. And so the, the subject bachelor contains the unmarried predicate and therefore it's an analytic statement. Um, his only argument that was ever presented was flawed, both in the sense that it was worded poorly it did not include all candidate explanations. Some of the candidate explanations um, weren't sensible. Um, basically, if it exists, one can candidate explanation is that it doesn't exist. It wasn't an exhaustive set of possibilities, and it was an attempt to shift the burden of proof onto me. He could have just presented it and moved on to his second argument and his argument about moral law and all that, but all of that should have been done in his opening statement, and he didn't do it. All of that should have been done in the opening statement. If you were in a, in a, like a collegiate scored debate and you tried to give an opening statement that presented no argument, no evidence, and then you tried to present the argument and evidence in the follow-up sections, uh, you'd lose points, you'd be disqualified, any number of things. But he wouldn't present his other arguments because he was desperate to get me to say, yes, there must be a non-contingent being and his argument was incapable of doing so to the point where when he would ask me, you know, whether or not I, are you convinced that there's a non-contingent being and I would say no, uh, or are you convinced that you're non-contingent? No, I'm not convinced. And, and he seemed to on occasion confuse whether or not I was asserting a position or merely rejecting a position because he would say, well, that's a blind faith position. No, not being convinced of your claim is not a blind faith position. It is not being convinced. And that's because you haven't presented a valid and sound argument or evidence to convince me. But what, whether or not I'm personally convinced should be completely irrelevant to your case for Christianity being true. This is one of probably a half a dozen absolute fatal flaws in the way Trey tried to do this. He tried to make it about me and atheism. Matt's the savior of atheism, maybe. Um, 
atheists are irrational. Their position is irrational. And if, if you can't give me a fifth option, then I win. No, people have tried that one before. Um, it was a parade of him trying to come at me and what I believe rather than doing what he's supposed to do, which is present a case for Christianity being true. He was so desperate to get me to concede a point that we never got to move on to anything else. He reminds me of uh, Sloan Lee, someone I debated in a team debate uh, with uh, John Ferrer, uh, John Ferrer and Sloan Lee against me and um, JT Everhard. And Sloan gave a, a moral argument that he had evaluated and he had evaluated all possible objections and found that none of them were, were good. Well, that was his opening statement, poisoning the well again. Uh, and Trey not only kind of did that, but tried to poison it with, you're probably going to hear whining or changing the subject. In contrast, what was my opening statement like? Well, I presented a lesson on the nature of claims, gave a few different categories of claims, talked about how if we're talking about Christian claims, there's either going to be biblical claims that come from the Bible, where that's the source, or extra-biblical claims, where there's some extra-biblical source that's going to uh, be in support of biblical claims, or maybe a modern source where somebody is talking about uh, putting Christianity into action. There'll be discussions like that. I talked about how there, the nature, the, the categories of those claims might be mundane, where it's a place name, Jerusalem. The existence of Jerusalem does not tell you anything at all about the truth of Christianity. Although, if we confirmed that there had never been a Jerusalem, that would certainly be a potential defeater uh, for certain versions of Christianity. The second category that I talked about was a mixed claim, where it has its origin in reality, um, but some, where, where there's some mundane fact, reality exists, where something about Christianity is offered as its explanation. And it's the explanation that needs to be demonstrated. And the third category of claim was something that's Christian-specific, something that is doctrinal, that isn't tied to an identifiable part of reality or trying to necessarily explain an identifiable part of reality, but is the tenet within the religion itself, things like sin, redemption, substitutionary atonement. Uh, I continued on to talk about the burden of proof, which we both agreed on, and how it would have been different if we'd have decided on the topic, is Christianity false? Because I put the categories of truth in there. I borrowed this from R and Raw. And for any claim, that claim is either evidently true, which I'm going to describe as demonstrably consistent with the facts of reality. The facts of reality. The very same thing that Trey said was his definition of truth. The facts of reality. You cannot make appeals to abstract, analytical uh, statements if you're going to say that you have a, a, a that your view of truth is that which comports to reality, nothing but synthetic arguments will do. Nothing but synthetic statements are going to get to the truth. You can use analytic statements, um, of course, but getting from here's an analytic statement that is a tautology or that we accept to therefore this is true in reality requires some sort of synthetic connection to the facts of reality. The three categories that I gave were the claim is evidently true, means it's demonstrable, um, and it, it is consistent with all relevant facts and the overwhelming, or the overwhelming majority of relevant facts. The second category is X is not evidently true, which means it isn't disproved by the evidence, but it doesn't have the quality or quantity of evidence that you would warrant uh, or that would warrant you believing that it's true. And the third category is that it is evidently not true, which is like saying it's false. It is inconsistent with the facts of reality such that we could generally say this is not true or this is false. Um, if the roles were reversed on Christianity, I pointed out, um, or if the roles were reversed to where we were saying is Christianity false, then those categories would be a little different. It's either X is evidently false, X is not evidently false, or X is evidently not false. Everything shifts if you if you change that, and then the burden of proof would be on the person who's trying to assert that Christianity is false. But he acknowledged he has the burden of proof. He has to tie Christianity to the facts of reality, which he cannot do from analytic statements alone. 
Um, I went through and listed some aspects of Christianity that are either not evidently true or evidently not true. The order of creation in Genesis, the origin of humans, of language, of animals, um, those are inconsistent with the facts of reality. The same is true for a global flood during a period when humans existed, uh, for the sun standing still in the sky, for giant humans living alongside regular humans, of uh, people living to be 900 years old. I didn't put that in there, but it should. Uh, the plagues of Egypt, miracles uh, can't be investigated and thus can't be uh, determined to be evidently true. The supernatural in its entirety can't currently be confirmed to be evidently true, um, which means they're at least in the not evidently true category and possibly false. Falsification or falsifiability is a key aspect of this. And then to make it as easy as possible, I pointed out a specific tenet of Christianity by reading what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, that if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you are still in your sins. I won't go into detail on all the things that I addressed about that later on, but that, I would argue, from the standpoint of almost every version of Christianity, the resurrection is the single most important fact. If you could demonstrate that the resurrection is true, and other things about Christianity might not necessarily be true, I think it'd be reasonable to say Christianity is, essential, is true. If you demonstrate that Christ was raised as a substitutionary atonement for sin, and that's a lot to do because it addresses specific things about Christianity, um, then I would think that it'd be reasonable to leave that, or, or just to say Christianity is true. If that one's not true, then even Paul thinks that your faith is in vain. And Paul, in that very sentence, makes the mistake of beginning with an assumption of sin, um, that even if Jesus wasn't real, you still got a problem of sin. And my argument, to, or my reply to that is, no, you don't. Uh, you've, you've taken an assumption and run with it. So there was no rebuttal to any of my points, no addressing of any of my points. And when, when this was pointed out, uh, that he got stuck at the outset and just wouldn't stop, he said it was because he never got to present his case and there wasn't time to rebut mine. We were there for over two hours. He wasted his opening, wouldn't move on until he got me to concede some point, which is irrelevant. What I concede is irrelevant to his case for Is Christianity True? I'm the only one who actually went into details about Christian doctrines in my opening and whether or not they were true. He was more interested in showing that, in, or asserting that the atheist worldview is irrational than he was in demonstrating that his worldview was true. Now, there were some good questions during the Q&A that exposed some things from him, um, which I'm not even going to pretend that I would have necessarily asked these or, if, or that they would have come up if he and I had been able to have a discussion, but we couldn't because there was constant interruptions and it, it's, it was obnoxious. But Somebody asked if I would be willing to concede a generalized version of his God so that he could then move on to the rest of his argument. And I gave a long answer for why um, I don't think that's a good idea, but that I might be willing to actually do that. Uh, it's, I, don't, I don't feel like giving away the farm. It's like saying, okay, I'll, I'll agree with you for the sake of argument that there is a God. Prove it's the Christian God. And then we spend a whole bunch of time on something that we both think is irrelevant if it's not for the first one. He pointed out during his opening, you can't have a word of God without a God, and that's why he's going to start by demonstrating that there's a God, except that he didn't. He, his, his version of a contingency argument was too flawed to ever get there. Um, he also was adamant that God cannot make humans capable of understanding him. And his answer when I pushed back on this was God can't make himself, which implied that what he's saying is, only God can understand God. God can't make us God, and therefore God can't make us understand God. But that's a bit of an equivocation fallacy because nobody is suggesting that God should be capable, although I don't know why God couldn't make me God, uh, other than he would no longer be God if God includes the definition that there can be only one. And if he made me God there would still be a God, 
and I would be God, and I would know all the same things, and this wouldn't be a problem because the old God would be gone, and the new God would be the same, and me. But there's an equivocation there because nobody's suggesting that God needs to make us capable of perfect, full understanding of God. Just that God doesn't have to be mysterious. God can provide evidence for this. God can provide evidence for every claim in the Bible, um, can manipulate time, evidently, uh, although we don't know for sure how much time manipulation God can or can't do. But he should be able to present uh, an explanation in such a way that we can understand it. Not that we would have full comprehension of it, but that we would understand it. And in fact, Trey is suggesting that he understands it and I don't. Um, Flatly said that about one of the biblical claims that we addressed. And this just shows the arrogance and the conflict because God can't make us capable of understanding and yet Trey understands things that I don't. Well, that means that God should at least be able to make me understand what Trey understands. Um, and yet doesn't. He pointed out that Christianity is patriarchal, but that this doesn't mean women are less than others. And I pointed out that not only have I done a video on the worth of women, which is right here on this same channel, you can find out exactly, chapter and verse, what the Bible has to say about women and equality. Um, But if you're going to admit that it's a patriarchal system, and you right off the bat suggest that that doesn't mean women are less than others, you've just defeated yourself. That is literally what the model is. Um, there's, there's not gender equality in the Bible. Women aren't allowed to own property in the same way or to the same extent. They don't inherit property the same way, the same extent. If they're slaves, they're not let go when the, men's, when the male slaves are let go. Um, they, it's, just, it's too much. Go watch, go watch the video. But here's the big thing, and thank you if you made it this far. I realize it's been an, a really long debate review for a debate that was over at like the 14-minute mark, maybe the 20-minute mark. I want to at least get my opening in. Here it is. Here's the takeaway. Somebody asked, could the evidence for Christianity be better? Great question. Whoever that is, thanks. Um, You've given me another question that I need to ask in future debates. His answer was no. The evidence could not possibly be better. So, if the evidence couldn't be better, why would you not make an evidentialist case? The evidence couldn't possibly be better, according to him. Why would you not make an evidentialist case? Well, his reason is that they're probabilistic, which means that you're not going to get to certainty. But so is all of science and everything that we know, essentially, about reality. It's all probabilistic. He thinks analytical arguments are certain, but they're not. They're tautologies in the sense that you've, you've created a definition and you are just analyzing that definition. You are not talking about anything that is necessarily tied to reality. Those things are synthetic things. And so if you have a, uh, a, a model of truth where truth comports to reality, then your case for that must be synthetic, not analytic. Meanwhile, claiming that the evidence could not possibly be better, he's saying that it wouldn't be better if we had original autographs of the books of the Bible. That seems bizarre to me. I would think that that would be better. I would think original autographs of the books of the Bible would be better evidence than the ones we currently have. I don't understand how anybody could think that that would not be better. Additionally, he thinks that the people who were there who were living witnesses and saw it, don't, they don't have better evidence than I do as someone who's getting it secondhand. His answer that the evidence could not possibly be better means that hearsay evidence is just as good as direct observation. And that is the super fatal flaw in everything about his model. 
when we got into, does he have good evidence for Jesus walking on water? He tried to pretend that there was archaeological evidence, and then when we pointed out that there weren't, he acknowledged that there wasn't, uh, weren't, <laughs> there wasn't, he acknowledged that there wasn't archaeological evidence for this, and that there could not be archaeological evidence, but archaeological evidence for other things within the Bible made those claims more believable, because the author of Luke Acts becomes a more reliable testifier to the truth. But Luke, first of all, not necessarily an eyewitness. You, Trey, are not an eyewitness. The nature of the quality of your hearsay evidence from an anonymous source that you can't verify and investigate, to say that that couldn't be better is to deny that the people who were witnesses had better evidence, that the women who walked up to the tomb had a broader, better understanding of the events that supposedly took place at that tomb than we do reading a few sentences about it centuries, millennia later. He's in love with analytical arguments, does not want to make the probabilistic arguments, but if he would had been if he'd just been allowed to uh, to do what he said he was going to do, he was going to get to the archaeological evidence. He was going to do that to try to tie something up in a synthetic way. I've already let James know, and I'll let everybody else know. I love doing the debates. Um, I will continue doing them. I will yes continue doing them at modern day debates. It's my job, and I enjoy it. But if I show up at another debate where we sit through someone's entire opening statement and the subject of the debate is only addressed in the last 30 seconds to one minute of their opening statement, which has now happened to me twice, the, there was someone's debate on Pascal's wager didn't really address Pascal's wager until the end of that, um, I'll leave. I will, in, I will give my opening statement, and I will conclude my opening statement with uh, some version of this. And since I'm the only one of the two of us who addressed the subject of this debate in anything more than a passing glance in their opening statement, I will now end this debate and go on with the rest of my life and not waste everybody's time. Because while we did get to some good discussion points, in part because of some good questions in Q&A, after we got past his unwillingness to move on without getting me to concede a point, um, there was some potential for discussion. Would I sit down with Trey again? Not unless we actually iron out some pretty strict uh, rules about what's going to happen and what's not going to happen because I'm tired of doing my work, doing my research, showing up to a debate about is Christianity true where in the opening statements, I spend almost all of my opening statement talking about Christianity and truth and how we can or can't tell, and my opponent spends his time complaining about why he's not an evidentialist, why he doesn't like presuppositionalist, what's wrong with both of those models, what model he's going to try to use, then says, I'm going to present three arguments, uh, one from contingency, one from moral uh, thing, and then one for... Uh, general reliability of the Bible from the standpoint of the science of archaeology, none of which actually, well, all right, only one of those things ever gets addressed. He had plenty of time in his opening statement. He still had probably, I think, uh, about two minutes left in his opening when he just stopped and said, let's get ready to rumble. And I'm a little tired of the well poisoning that goes on when someone's like, now, I'm going to do this, and you might hear some complaining or whining or a desperate attempt to change the subject. Trey is the one that is desperate to change the subject. Trey should not have accepted a debate on is Christianity true with the definition that truth is that which comports to reality, only to say he's not going to be presenting evidence, he's not going to be presenting synthetic arguments that tie things to reality. He's just going to present an analytical contingent argument that is horribly written to the point that we can't move on because he also is desperate to suggest that atheists are just irrational 
And that's more important to him than defending the subject. We'll see you next time. Thanks.